consider that when you're doing social media, instead of making a blast to 10,000 or 100,000 or however many you know people that you have on Instagram, you're talking to one person like a friend or family member, or, you know, whatever, whatever empowers you. But the bottom line is it's a conversation. You're not screaming at them. You're not breaking glass to get their attention. You're not doing that stuff. What you're doing is you're having a conversation where you're just as actively listening as you are communicating. And the more you can do that, the more you will build your social media. And, you know, and it's, it does take time. It does take patience. It does take discipline and focus to do it. But when you do, you will have a audience of people who are converting for you and no record company and no publisher can take it, take it with you. You can take it with you. It's yours. They can't take it away. They can't, they can't like take over your socials and, you know, you know, supplant you. Even if you sell your catalog, you still have control over the narrative of who and what you are as an artist. And that's, that's real power. My name is Michael Whalen, and I am a composer. I'm a music supervisor. I've been doing this for 35 years. Uh, I've won a couple of these. It's an Emmy Award. Um, I've done, I don't know, like 900 TV shows, uh, thousands and thousands of commercials, uh, a couple of dozen feature films. And I just finished my 42nd solo album, which came out last Friday, and I'm really proud of it. And uh, I've also been a professor. I've taught at four universities. I'm writing my first book on music business. I'm an expert on copyright law and digital media, which I'm not exactly sure how that happened. I think it happened out of need. Um, and I also have a company called Artist Expansion where I consult with artists and I work with them on marketing, social media, label strategy. I will even be a, I will pretend to be a label. I will do all the label stuff for them. I'll do art direction. I'll make sure that it gets posted correctly to the aggregator, all that stuff. So, uh, you know, my whole life has been about empowering people. Um, my students, especially from City College and NYU and Berkeley, that have gone on and done some really, really incredible stuff. And I have been very, very proud to start a few dozen careers of people who have been really successful in music. So that's a little bit about me. But what you know, I was talking to my friends at, you know, 24 seven, and we're going to talk about some stuff that if you've been around for a while, you're going to go, well, this is sort of basic stuff. It's not really, it, this is the essential stuff that you need to have if you're going to be successful. And we're going to do it kind of quickly because we only have an hour or so to talk. And I also want to get some questions in. So, um, uh, Davina is going to be looking at the Q and A and if you've got questions about anything that we're doing, she's going to jump in and say, "Michael, there's a question," and and we will and and we will answer it, um, or or we'll just stack them up for the end, you know, whatever whatever kind of works in, in kind of the in, in the conversation. But yep. so um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. What the deal is, go ahead and put your questions in the chat, or you can drop them in the Q and A. And yeah, yeah. All right. There we go. So I got I, I we got the uh, the uh, share screen up. I got my my first slide up. So the very first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the difference between going to a label and releasing it yourself. So ten years ago, going to a label, whether it was an independent label or a major label, was it was a choice because. They had resources and they had money and they did stuff that you couldn't really do on your own. There was really no way of doing, especially for the major labels, uh, from a promotion standpoint, you know, any of that stuff yourself. Ten years later, now there are so many tools for you to get the word out. And there are so many things that you can be doing to build your audience that self-release is really something that you should be looking at. And what you really want to be doing is as you're looking at a deal, you want to be saying to yourself, okay, if I take any label deal, I will be giving away at least 50% of the royalties. In some cases, it's going to be more than 50%, but most streaming deals now are 50-50. So the most important thing that you want to be thinking about when it comes to releasing your music is who is 
your audience. And we're going to talk about that a lot more later. But your ability to control the narrative to your audience is the key to your success. And see, look, I've been doing this now for three minutes, and I have just given you the key to your success. <laughs> so the, key, the, the absolutely positively, your ability to control the narrative with your people. And you're going to say, well, I don't understand. What does that mean? Okay. So pretend that your fans and your listeners live in a container. So that container could be your email list. It could be a Facebook page. It could be your Instagram. It could be uh, TikTok. TikTok is actually a separate conversation, but, but like a traditional social media or mailing list. And by the way, let me just make a plug here. Mailing lists are really effective. They've been around for a long time. In fact, in some cases, longer than some of you guys have been alive. And they are still really effective. Why? Because your message is put into the lap, digitally speaking, of the people you want to get it to. And I got to say, you know, I only send out four or five um, newsletters uh, a year, and they're incredibly effective in terms of the open rate and conversion. That's going to be something else we're going to talk about today. It's a very important number. But anyway, but your ability to control the narrative to your people is essential. So in my case, I have a Facebook page, which has about 80,000 followers. I have about, I don't know, 9,000 people on Instagram. I have a mailing list with about 4,000 people. So if you take all of that stuff put together, you'd say, okay, well, you know, you've got a lot of people. Five years ago, people were always talking about how many followers do you have? How many followers do you have? How many followers do you have? It, that's not the important number anymore. The important number is what is your conversion rate? So if you've got a thousand people following you on Instagram, for example, how many of those people will convert, will take action on something that you offer them? So if you've got an album, will they stream? Will they playlist it? What, what are they going to do? Are they going to take action on what you're offering them? If you're doing a live show, are they going to take action on what you're offering them? If you have a t-shirt or whatever, are they going to take action on what you're offering them? So a guy like Dwayne The Rock Johnson is the most important guy in media because his conversion rate is measurable at anywhere between 10 to 12 percent, and he has more than 400 million people following him on Instagram. So that man can point 40 million people at anything he's doing. So whether that's a movie or a TV show or his tequila or Under Armour and tennis shoes or whatever he's doing, he can point 40 million people who will go out and do what he asked them to do. And that is an incredible amount of power. In your case, if you've got a thousand people following you and you've got a conversion rate of 5%, maybe 7%, which is about what I have, you have a career. So in that world, if you can depend on 5% of your followers converting into things you have, you're, you're, you're offering them, you actually have an opportunity to have a career because then you can go to a label, you can go to a publisher, you can go to uh, a venue, a small venue who's gonna be looking at saying, okay, well, um, you've got to have at least 30 people walk in the door in this area. Will your social media do that? Do you have conversion numbers? So I can look at that and you can, you know, and I'll book you because most things now in music guys, bad news first have nothing to do with the quality of your music. Bad news first. Data. So how is the data working for you or working against you in terms of making a convincing argument that you're relevant for a record label if you want a deal. I'm not I'm not plus or minus on that, by the way. I mean, I've worked with lots of people with record deals and I've worked with a lot of people who don't. I've run a record label. The bottom line is you need to do what works for you, but the thing that's going to get you across the goal line with anybody is your ability to convert with the audience that you have. So the power of being a self-released artist is in your ability to grow your audience organically and to have those people convert into the things that you do. And so we'll talk about social media a little bit, but how are you offering them these things? Do they trust you? Do they think you're listening to what they're saying? You put out something, they say something back, or are you, are you being responsive to them? That's very important. You have to remember that social media is not announcing stuff. 
It's a conversation. It's a two-way conversation. So are you creating opportunities for your audience in such a way where they are going to take it and they're going to take action on it? Okay. So we talked a little bit about taking control of your narrative and your brand. And I think a lot of artists don't really understand what brand is. They think, okay, well, I've got this water here and I'm going to go on Instagram and I'm going to hawk it. And that's my brand as I go and I hawk something wrong. Your brand is the associations that people have when your music comes up. So if someone's talking about music and they go, oh yeah, Michael Whelan, yeah, I, I, I've heard his stuff, or no, I don't have any idea who that person is. So now you've got an opportunity to, to create a brand. Brand is basically what people are talking about out there in the world, the associations that people have, like, like when your music comes up, when people talk about you, what comes up with it, what conversations are there? And then your ability to control that narrative of who you are as your brand, both going against what people expect and not with what people expect, is really going to be your ability to help grow yourself using your brand as a powerful focus, a powerful lens for really bringing things into focus for your career. Okay, so one of the things that we have to touch on in this conversation is we have to talk about the connection between you creating your music and you going out and how are you going to distribute it? Because the days of making an album and then saying, well, you know, the music's going to sell itself. The, guys, that conversation is so over. It's so over. You have to control the narrative on what your music is. And one of the best and most effective ways to get your narrative out there is to play live. Now, it is hard these days to get booked in a small venue. In fact, it's probably harder now than it ever has been because, A, there is an enormous amount of competition for those. A lot of small venues are very, very, very careful about who they book and why they book them and are those seats going to be filled and all that stuff. So there, it's very, very, very tough. Also, live performance is one of the few places where there is sort of count onable money. So like if you've gotten past the social media thing and you've gotten through the promoter or gotten to the venue and you've gotten booked, now it's, okay, well, you're going to get X dollars for your performance or you're going to get X percent of the gate or, or both, or maybe you'll get a percentage of the bar. It depends on what, what deal you make. But the bottom line is, it's one of the few places in music that if you get booked, there is a number associated with it, maybe. So some small venues still have a thing. It's, this, it's very much like this in New York and other big cities like Los Angeles and Chicago. It's also like this, where they will book you and you will promise them at least 20 people, 25 people, maybe even 30 people in the door and they'll all pay five, 10, 15, $20 to get in. And maybe you'll get a small portion of that. But in sometimes they'll say, no, you want 20 people and we'll let you play for tips, which isn't great. But you wanna be looking at that live performance opportunity as an opportunity to get the word out about your music and to build your mailing list. So have you ever gone to a gig and someone's, you know, like there's someone at the door like trying to sign you up for the mailing list or they've got a QR code. So you scan it with your phone and then you sign up for their mailing list. It's, it can be awkward and, you know, clunky and whatever, but guys, your mailing list and your ability to track fans who have already decided to come out for you and your music is so important. I, I Guys, I would rather have a hundred people who have demonstrated some sort of action on my music. They've Shazammed it, they've playlisted it, they've liked it, they've shared it, they've commented on it versus a hundred thousand people and you have no idea what's going on with them. So having people who have already voted with their feet and said, I like this music, 
I want to be part of this conversation. How do I do that? Live performances, even if you're not getting a great, you know, gig, money, whatever, one of the most important pieces of currency is your ability to take that audience and try to get their email addresses and any other kind of metadata from them that you possibly can. Also, live performances can live in a couple of different places. Like there's some places that are set up for you to do streaming from their place. They sometimes hit you with a fee. Some bars are charging you an origination fee, which is totally ludicrous. I think if they're not going to pay you a lot and you're going to play for tips, they should throw in streaming or they should give you the video of your gig. That way you can be using it for promotion. You can be putting it on YouTube. You can find ways to monetize that content, which leads me to a point. Anytime you're making music, you're practicing music, you're performing music, you are trying to do anything around your music is an opportunity to create content for social media. One of the things that you hear over and over again from artists, and I have worked with many, is they get to a place where they're like, well, I don't have anything to talk about on social media. Oh my goodness. You have to plan things out. You have to warehouse things that you have. People like, you know, we were talking about The Rock. He has a four-person social media team following that man around 24-7. He has a huge grid every month of when things are going to be posted, you know, and how it's going to tie in with promotions for other campaigns and other things that he's involved with. So you want to be as intentional and organized with your social media as possible because that will turn into numbers, which will turn into a higher conversion rate, which will turn into live performances, which will turn into label interest, which will turn into your ability to get on better playlists with Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon and Pandora. So all of these things converge into one, but being focused and disciplined about how you deal with your social media is so important. Okay, so we're going to switch gigs a little bit. Uh, uh, geared a little bit. So, and these four bullet points, I was saying this to uh, Davina before, I could probably talk about for hours. But one of the things that I find incredibly shocking are people who are in music, they might even be established, they may have even had some real success. They've had a hit song. They've had some stuff covered. They've had their stuff picked up for a TV show. And they don't really have an industry vocabulary. They don't speak the language of publishing. They don't speak the language of, um, of contracts. You know, a lot of people are like, well, I don't really understand them and I don't know really how they work. Guys, you have to know. So if you have any questions about, especially on the legal side, go to a lawyer or somebody in the know that you trust and ask dumb questions. There are no dumb questions because your ability to be able to speak about this is going to be the difference between you getting a good deal or no deal at all. So you've got to have a really good working vocabulary, like what's publishing? So my favorite thing is when you talk about music publishing, they're like, you mean like, you know, printing music books? No, I don't mean that. That's folio. So if you make a folio, that's the sheet music that goes with your music, with the song that you've done. Publishing is the administration of your copyright. So when you hear someone talking about music publishing, who administers the rights to that song? That's what it is. The other thing that I find really incredible is if you have a publishing deal or if you know lots of writers, people will sit down and they'll co-write. Like, you know, in, in Nashville, it's common. You just kind of get into a room and be like, hey, what do you want to talk about? Hey, do you have an idea for a song? Cool. Off you go. But before you do anything, you have to have a collaboration agreement, even if it's a single sentence and it like it looks like Today is April 26th and I'm working with John Doe and we're writing this song called 
to be decided later. <laughs> and we have agreed, no matter who, how this song goes, that we're going to split the publishing, the writer share and the publisher share 50-50 on this song. And I have a file drawer full of collaboration agreements that I've had with people that I've co-written with. And in Nashville, in Los Angeles too, but in really in Nashville, those agreements are signed before you even pick up a guitar and say, hey, let's work together because you just want to get that out of the way. A very famous story is that like on Beyonce's first solo record, there were so many people who wrote on that record. Like some of the songs have got 10, 12, 15, 17 writers on them. And there was no collaboration agreements and there was no real agreement about who got what. And so the royalties from that album sat in escrow for years while the writers thought about rights and who did what and who gets what percentage of what. And if you guys, if you guys do nothing else tonight, sign collaboration agreements. And if you talk about it early on, it will actually set the tone for your working relationship with people. It will be like, hey, you're an organized person. You want to you wanna be working transparently. And you also want to be in a place where you are not just protecting your own rights, but you are looking out for the people you're working with. So there you go. So your catalog, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later, but you have to know what your catalog is. And you're going to say, well, I've already, you know, I've only written four songs. There's your catalog. You've got a four song catalog. Sounds great. Uh, in my case, <laughs> um, I honestly don't know how many pieces, cues, and songs that I've written. Uh, 10,000. I mean, it's actually easier for me to be thinking about the music that I've done in terms of numbers of hours of music, especially with television and film. Um, than anything else, but you have to have a handle on your catalog. I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen in the news and in the media, people like Bruce Springsteen and um, uh, who else? Well, Bruce, Bruce is a, a big one. Uh, even um, Justin Bieber um, oh, so, so, sold his uh, catalog, you know, and, you know, uh, Bruce got $550 million from Sony. So this is a guy who on record one, Album one, he walked into Sony and said, I want the same deal that Bob Dylan got, which is Bob Dylan kept his publishing and owned 100% of his masters. And he licensed them to Sony and then they re-upped the license and re-upped the, the license. And that was the deal that, that Bruce got. So what constitutes your catalog? Do you know your catalog? Do you know what the disposition is? Meaning who owns it and who controls your catalog? There you go. The last thing you must do, we talked about it, and I'm going to say this in a slightly different way, is engaging with social media. So one of the biggest problems that artists have with social media is being consistent. So what I get a lot from the artists that I work with, the students that I've taught, the people that I know, oh, well, I can't do it every day. Then don't. If you want to post once a week, then post once a week and get into that pace. You want to post a few times a month, then do that. But be consistent. You want to post four times a day? I don't know if I would, but okay, you could do that. But the bottom line is be consistent. Create enough content where you can cover things, create things that's going to help you create the narrative of who and what you are as your brand. But you've got to create a narrative on social media, which is compelling. And I think, frankly, the, the most important thing that you can do on social media is be honest. All of this like posing and, you know, being slick and whatever, what people connect with is a, a writer and a performer who is willing to kind of break themselves all the way down and be a normal person. And then they generate themselves into greatness. They generate themselves into performance. They generate themselves into creating a great song. And then they go to bed and then they wake up in the morning and they do it again. So are you willing to kind of show people like, you know, when you don't really have your act together and then here's the process of me putting the things together. So then when you finally do get on stage and when you finally do release something and you do the cool video, people have seen the progression and they've seen that you're a real person 
who's creating music, you're, you're committed to it, but you have to generate yourself into the conversation because what people want is they want to see themselves in you. The conversation on social media isn't about you. It's about what you represent for the people who are looking at your social media. Very important. Okay, so we talked about catalogs a little bit. So I would say you need to own your catalog. And you're going to say, well, I've already signed a publishing deal or I've already signed a record deal and it's gone. Okay, fine. But I think in this environment, especially with the rise of the independent artist and your ability to be able to do it yourself, your ability to control your master rights and your publishing rights are so important. So, okay. So let's take a second and talk about music rights. I'm, I, I, I've been on a couple of things for 24 seven. I know they've covered some of this. And for some of you guys who have been around, this may be basic, but this is also really important. So bottom line, when you write a song and record it, there are two sets of rights that come with it. The first is the recording of the song. It's the recording of the song, okay? So you've written the song and you put some tracks down, you, you make a beat, you rap over it, you sing it, you do whatever you're gonna do. Sounds great. The other rights is the publishing. That's the notes of the song. That's the lyrics of the song. And so the bottom line is that your catalog of your songs are actually made up of two sets of rights. One is the publishing, the notes and the lyrics, and the other one is the recording, and they live sometimes together and sometimes apart. You can have a record deal where they own your master or they license your master, and you can still own your publishing. You can have a publishing deal where they own or administer your publishing and you own your masters. So in my case, I own my masters and my publishing, but I have a distribution deal with a company who helps me get the word out about my stuff. They're connected to Universal. Going through that machine is wonderful because it, they're huge and they have a big footprint and that's helpful. And then I have a company in California which administers my publishing for me so I don't have to try to figure out, you know, 15 different sources of income from foreign sources and different, you know, performing rights organizations. And there you go. So you must own your catalog or understand what you're selling. So there are situations where you could have a publisher say, I want to buy your catalog, or I want to buy an interest in your catalog, and they give you a big advance. So here's the Michael Whalen rule for this. The money that you're being offered for your catalog, whether it's the recording and the publishing, or both of them put together, needs to be a life-changing amount of money period, end of story. So that's going to be different for every single person on this webinar. So if somebody says, I'm going to give you $5,000 to buy your recordings and your publishing, and that is a meaningful amount of money that's going to change your life. Okay. I think that one of the things that you should look at is what is the actual cost of you selling your catalog in the long run? By you not being able to control it, by you not being able to collect, by you not being able to create new sources of income with it, monetize it, what are you actually losing? So what they're paying you up front is actually incredibly cheap. You're selling your catalog for cheap, uh, really in comparison to what they could be making in the long run. So own your catalog or understand what you're selling. And this goes back to the very first thing we talked about, about having a working vocabulary and understanding that when you're making these rights, when you're creating songs, when you're creating recordings, your ability to have a meaningful mastery over the vocabulary of the music business is so important. Um, I have seen way too many people get burned on catalog sales, on publishing deals, on record deals, because they simply did not understand the long term, and I mean horizons that are longer than five years, on what their catalog could actually be worth. So I have done, I've had many publishing deals, but 
I think at the end of the day, you really want to be looking at what is value. Okay, so if you go to business school, on the very first day of going to business school, they're going to define value. And it's going to sound sort of like this. Here's a variation. In the absence of value, price matters. So like if you go to a store and you find something like this bottle of water and you say, well, this, bo this bottle of water is going to cost you $20. You're going to be like, $20? That's a lot for a, a bottle of water. But if you are held captive in an airport and the only place you can buy water is at one of those newsstands and it's going to cost you $20, there's probably a pretty good chance you're going to pay the price. Because in that moment, your value for that water in your circumstances has changed. So like if a doctor says to you, you need a life-saving surgery, the first thing out of your mouth normally is not going to be what does it cost? It's going to be how do we how do we schedule this and I'll figure out how to pay for it later if you don't have insurance. So you must own your catalog or understand what you're selling. So bottom line, you have to get a working more than a working, but definitely a working vocabulary, especially around music business, master rights, publishing rights. Okay. So I mentioned when I introduced myself that I'm a music supervisor. And a music supervisor is the guy who picks the songs that go into TV shows and films. And I have worked on many. And the bottom line, and this is sort of like just sort of a bridge to from the last conversation we had to this conversation, which is really important, is if you own both the master recording rights to the recording and your publishing, um, that's going to make you more attractive to a music supervisor than if you have a big publishing deal and a big record deal. Okay, and here's why. So if I am a music supervisor and I hear a song by you, that I like, and I have a limited budget, my ability to clear both sides of a song, and that's going to be a term that you're going to hear a lot with music supervisors, both sides, publishing, master rights. So if I can go to one person and pay one amount of money and get both rights cleared, and it's simple and I don't have to talk to somebody at Sony or go through the universal machine or go to Warner's or all that stuff where it's going to slow me down and it's going to be a hassle. And it's probably going to be more expensive because it's a big company. It's going to make you more attractive. So this really goes back to what I was saying about you got to either keep your rights to your material or know what you're selling. If you've got material that you think is going to be attractive for use in TV shows and films, you really might want to look at how you are dealing with your catalog. Do you really want to sell it? I would say no. Okay. The most important thing about communicating with music supervisors is not to bug them. So <laughs> I get six to 10 emails a day from people doing blind submissions to me. I do not know a single music supervisor who will look at a blind submission. Number one, there's a legal issue there where if somebody sends you something and you use something for a film that sounds vaguely like the thing that somebody sent to you, they can say, you got the idea from hearing their material and then you went and found it from somebody else, cheaper, better, or whatever. And, you know, they can turn around and see you and say, see, you stole my idea, you stole my song, or you stole, you stole the potential income that I would have gotten from it. So when I get blind submissions from people, I'm like, I got your email. I did not listen to your material. Have a nice day. So when you communicate with the music supervisor, the key to the whole thing is do your homework. And you're going to say, well, how do I do that? Okay, great. So you really want to have an IMDB pro account, Internet Movie Database pro account. And you really want to see who the music supervisors are 
on films. If you look under the uh, filmmakers and you go all the way down to the bottom to the music department, you will find the name of the person doing music supervision or music clearance, or there's a couple of maybe the music editor. There's a couple of different ways to sort of couch it. But the bottom line is you need to know, A, what are they working on? Are they working on Fast and Furious 9, which is going to have a very different soundtrack than working on the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon, which is going to be a completely different thing. Lots of music used, very different kind. So you need to know what this person has used in the past on the shows and the films that they've done, and what are they working on now, and does your music come along and make their job easier? Bottom line. So I have worked with people and I have found people who have done their homework, know what I'm working on, have an idea of what I've picked in the past. They have a sense of what the budget is. So if I don't have a lot of money for music, I'm not looking at, you know, Adele. I'm not looking at, you know, Rihanna. I don't have money for that. So the bottom line is, if you do your homework and you're smart about how you pitch things, you can say, you can send a note without your music because of the legal thing, you can say, look, I've done, I've done my homework on you. I know what you're working on. I have something that I think is going to be appropriate. May I send it to you? Ask permission to send your material. Oh, makes such a difference. And if the person really has done their homework and they've really, um, they're, they're sending you something that could really be considered and you made, made my uh, job easier, oh, it, it happens so few and far between. And you really, 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 really want to do that. It cannot just be hawk the song out there, hawk the song out there, hawk the song out there. The other thing I want to say is that there is companies like Taxi and other places where they sort of sell access to music supervisors. I'm not a big fan of those, of, of those services. And the reason why is because in some cases, they will make you sign an agreement saying, if I get a sync license for it, we own half the publishing. And then sometimes they'll say, not only do we own the publishing, but we also own half the master. And yeah, you got a sync license and yeah, you're on a TV show and yeah, you might be getting some performance income from it, but what have you lost by doing that transaction going forward? Because now these people who have been working with your material They've taken half your rights away. So the bottom line is you've got to know what you're doing with publishing. You've got to know what you're doing with your rights and work with music supervisors as the answer to their problem. You want to be answering a question. You don't even know what the question is. You want to be answering a question in such a way where you show up and people go, oh, it's a godsend. This, this guy just fell out of the, the, the clouds and uh, this is terrific. And thank you for doing your homework. And thank you for making this easier for me. So there, there's that. I didn't want to jump back to one thing for a second. So we talked a little bit about labels versus self-release. And like I said, I'm not predisposed to going one way or another. But if in my conversation for the last half an hour has made any difference for you, owning your material, knowing the vocabulary, understanding how people around the industry work, whether it's a music supervisor or a publisher or a label or a guy who owns a venue that you want to play at. The bottom line is you can have a very successful career on your own. You don't need to have a, a label behind you. Because I think for a long time, Artists had it like, okay, I got signed. Now I'm a credible person. <laughs> so for everybody on tonight's webinar, I just want to sort of magically give you fairy dust and say, guess what? I validate you and you are credible. You do not need a publisher to give you that stamp of approval or a label to give you that stamp of approval because unless they're really earning their money, I think you will look at it in a few months or a few years or in a decade or two and be like, oh, I cannot believe I did that deal. So one of my favorite songs, one of my best songs is gone. Unless 
you get a life-changing amount of money up front, and you're only going to do that by knowing what's happening with the vocabulary and, and what's happening with music business. So I covered an enormous amount of stuff, and I just sort of want to check in and just make sure that everybody's okay. And uh, if there's any questions, uh, Davina, let me know, and uh, we will... Uh, we will ju- we'll jump into this. I will stop the share of this so I can see everybody close up. Yeah, so we do have a question. Yep. Um, Mike Dawson said, thank you, Michael. Uh, talk about team building as, um, as your career progressed, engineers, producers, partnerships. Great question. Okay, so let me just start with the obvious thing. No artist is successful alone ever so these people are like i'm gonna do it all myself and i'm gonna make this happen um no you're not bottom line so i would say and i don't want to say don't quote me on this but you can quote me on this, <laughs> which is the most important single person out of the gate for you to have is to have access to a good music attorney. So that doesn't necessarily mean you're picking up the phone and you're calling them all the time, but you do need an information resource, which is um, reliable and accurate. There are a lot of of people putting themselves out there who give the worst advice and they really don't know how things work. So you really want to do your homework on who that person is and are they really helping? So that's number one person. Number two person in this environment in terms of building a team, and this may sound strange, but I'll say it like this, is someone to help you with social media. So social media, creating content for social media, making sure that the stuff you're creating and you're posting looks great. But the most important thing on a social media post, especially when you're a musician, is what? The sound. So having someone work with you who's going to help you format your content, maybe help you shoot stuff, uh, help you art direct stuff. um, I think that's, I think that's really important because I, especially in the last five or seven years, I think there's so much content to be made. If you don't have someone working with you even if it's just like once a month to help you like crank out some major posts, um, you're going to be behind and you're going to go, oh, yeah, I'm not really, I'm not really getting it. The third thing is who is administering your publishing? So is it a publishing administrator? Is it a publishing company that offers you an administration deal? Or do you sign a publishing deal such that they own half your publishing or 100% of your publishing, depending on what the deal is and how much money they offer you? But the bottom line is the third person on your team is who is publishing, who is your publishing administrator? And are they working for you? So if somebody is administrating your catalog, bottom line, they have a fiduciary, legal term, a fiduciary responsibility to you to take care of you, to make sure that your interests are being served by what they're doing. So your job is to vet people carefully and do you trust this person? Does this person act with transparency and integrity? Very important. And then I think the last thing would be if you really feel the need to sign a deal, you know, like whether it's a distribution deal with a label or to become an artist, and they're really offering you resources that you don't have yourself, then I think it's worth it. Like the the deal that I have with the distributor that I have, the guy who runs it is one of my favorite music people in the world. He's a really, really, really smart guy. He gives great advice. He loves the music. And um, and he's constantly another pair of eyes on things. And he's come up with some great you know, suggestions and solutions. So like I said, I'm not against label deals, but you know, whoever you're talking to really, really, really has to bring to the fore the value. And we talked, we talked about what value is. Are they earning the piece that they're taking from you, whether it's 10 or 15% as an administrator, 50% on a co-publishing deal? Are they earning it with the suggestions they make, the doors they're opening, and the opportunities they bring to you? Any other questions? Yep. So it says, um, Andy, 
asks, how do you find someone to administer your publishing? And is this something a music attorney would do? Great question. Um, some music attorneys do. They do. Uh, sometimes they have somebody in their office who will uh, do publishing administration. Um, very often they have relationships with publishers and people who do administration, and they can point you in the right direction. Like I talked about at the beginning, the thing that's going to be the difference between you getting a publishing deal or an administration deal or a label deal, or even getting booked at a club or a venue is going to be numbers. So true story. I'm not trying to shock anybody, but here you go. I've probably had at least nine publishing deals in 35 years. And in my initial conversation in talking about doing a deal, they have never once asked to listen to music. <laughs> they have only said, send us a spreadsheet of your catalog. Remember, we talked about catalogs. And what are your quarterly earnings? Period, end of story. So they want to know what your catalog is. Uh, they want to see how much work it's going to be to administer your catalog, your catalog and your copyrights. And they want to see what you're making now, not what you could potentially be making, uh, you know, if they work with you, what are you making now? Because that's what they're going to be commissioning on starting day one. So you really have to be making enough money uh, and getting enough sort of, you know, wherewithal financially for them to jump in and, and make that happen. But a single sync license on a movie can completely change your publishing. Um, a single deal that you make with somebody who wants to use your music for or even like a corporate video or whatever can completely change your entire publishing catalog. So it's not like you need like 100 deals to say, okay, now I'm ready for an administrator but you do need to be demonstrating statistically that you have money coming in the door. There's something for them to, to commission and to take a piece of, and there's something for them to, uh, to build on. If you've got zero going on, unless you are like the, the next great unknown unsigned person, it's unlikely you're going to get a deal. Any other questions? So for me, I, I do have a question. If we back just a little bit more. So you said have um, a pro account, the IM DB account, to find supervisors. Yeah. And I think I missed it, but could you explain that one more time? Is it cool to just go? I know you said, like, don't be a bugaboo, pretty much. Um, yeah. But what and I'm pretty sure you already said this, but what do we need in order to reach out? Okay, so I'm going to see if I can do this right now. So right now, I am on IMDb. Can everybody see that? Davina, can you see this? Yeah. All right, cool. So you're on IMDb Pro. I am looking at the new Super Mario uh, Brothers movie, and this is how it comes up. So movie is there. You have all these different tabs. You know, the first one obviously is the cast, but the thing that you're talking, that I'm talking about is who are the filmmakers? So you see who the directors are, you see the writer, the producers, you see the composer. So it was Brian and Koji, two, two major guys. And then you go all the way down, all the way down to music department. So you see all the people who worked on this and you can see, that some of the people who played on it got credit. And you can see the person who actually uh, contracted the uh, orchestra. Uh, music editor is good. And you can see all the people that you would want to contact. And so why don't we just stay with music, music editor? So say you want to contact the music editor, you go to his page. And he's got a direct contact. He's got an email address, and so you can email him, or you can see, um, you know, like you know what his, uh, um, you know, who his uh, agent is, or you know, maybe they've got something else. Here's my page on IMDb. Uh, you can contact me, and you know, you can email me and do that. But the bottom line is, you really want to be in 
a conversation called, I am willing to dig and do the due diligence to find the people that I think I want to connect with. And I, and I say think because you need to really know what's happening in the industry. What, like, you know, if there's a new John Wick movie happening, what music have they used in the past? If there's a new Fast and Furious movie going on, what mu music have they used in the past? Is your music going to be something that's even in the universe of what they might use? And so that will help a lot if you know what's happening, read the trades. There's so many different websites, you know, uh, Variety and Hollywood Reporter and, and uh, box, box Office Mojo. And there's so many different pages you can look at and you can see what's happening in the industry. Um, but um, IMDb Pro is really the Bible of film and TV and it's a great place to start. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, let's see. I have one. Okay, it says, um, Heidi said, would you include production costs when considering the full value of your catalog for sale? If you're going to sell your catalog, what you put into it in terms of the production, musician, studio, mastering, artwork, all that stuff is part of it. But ultimately, the value of your material is the money it is generating out in the world. So if you've got a song that you've spent a couple of thousand dollars on it and it hasn't recouped, it hasn't made that money back from streaming or from sync licenses or whatever, it's probably unlikely that a record company or a publisher is going to be um, interested in buying it if it hasn't like gotten back to even yet, because um, you can say, well, I spent $20,000 making this album. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's worth $20,000. So just because you spent that money does not necessarily mean that it automatically is worth that money. Um, the only the only really reasonable uh, criteria for the value of a catalog is what it is generating out in the world. Um, it's at, one of the reasons why I think people are very, very, very careful now about production costs, about spending too much on things, about spending too much on social media, uh, music videos, all that stuff. Um, but just be careful. If you walk in the door and you've got a great song, it's a great song, but you can't walk into somebody and say, okay, well, I only consider this if you can help me, you know, get even with the money that I put into it because a record company and a publisher is just going to say that's ludicrous. If it's not generating money, then it's worth zero to me. Any other questions? Mm, facts. So yes. Um, let's see. Derek wanted to know, how do you find time in your day to be so productive, creating amazing music and keeping track of the business end as well? Do you have a set, uh, do you have set working hours? Great question. So one of the things you will always see with successful people is their ability to control their schedule. So like if we were talking about, you know, Beyonce before, when Beyonce gets on a plane and it's supposed to leave at six o'clock, guess what happens? It leaves at six o'clock. It doesn't leave at 6.05 or 6.30 or seven o'clock. She's on the plane and it leaves. So successful people have a relationship with time, which is I say, and the world makes it happen. That's really the definition of power. You really say, I'm going to declare this concert, this action, this whatever into existence. And because I am who I am and I'm doing something. So I schedule when I write, I schedule time to surf the web. I schedule time with my clients, my consulting clients. Um, and I write every single day. So even if I'm away, I have a laptop and a small USB keyboard and I've got something to put ideas down with. And I am very disciplined about the writing process. So I get a lot done mostly because I really, really have a powerful relationship to my schedule and to time. 
I love that. I'm still, I'm still working on that. <laughs> no, we are all working on it. And I, it, it took me a long time to get there. I'm 57 years old. And I would say I've really only had this kind of relationship to my schedule in the last 15 years. All right. We do have another question. Great. Um, oh, who was one of your most important mentors as your career started? And why were they so important? Great, great question. So um, very, very early in my career, there was uh, here in New York, a composer named Charles Gross, wonderful composer. And he worked on some really cool movies and he did some stuff. And he was incredibly helpful in terms of talking about the business. So like when he got commissioned to work on a movie or a TV show, he would always show me the contract and he would always tell me about like the negotiations and he would always say, okay, well, I'm getting this and I have to do this. And here's what the deadline is. Oh, it made such a difference. So one of the things that I have done in the past is I've had interns come work with me. And one of the things that I do is I instill the Michael Whalen method but one of the things that you want to do is be around producers that you respect and people, you know, whose music is cool. You want to be around um, composers. You want to be around uh, publishing people and legal people. So you've got that sense of that's something you're interested in. If you're interested in going into management or the business side, go work for a manager. Um, because I think seeing how other people conduct their businesses is such a powerful a laboratory and such a powerful place to be because you may or may not run your business the way they do. And, you know, sometimes seeing what it is not something that you're not attracted to something that is not going to be something that works for you is just as powerful as ex- discovering something that is. Yeah. I agree with that. 100% surround oh, awesome. yourself with the people that you want to be around. Um, not a question, but Heidi said, thank you, Michael, such an informative and valuable hour. I agree 100, 100%. Great. Any, uh, any, anything else, uh, we, uh, any questions or anything else you think I should cover or try to clarify before we uh, sign off? Um, I think we actually, we did a lot and it was so, you, you made it so clear and so easy to understand um, is why. I love this so much. I've been doing this for a very long time. And you do, I tell you, I, especially when it comes to publishing and master and your masters, I love that subject so much, you know, because it's so important and we need to continue to educate the artists on it. Um, So I actually have him teach me all the time. I'm asking the same questions. I'm like, but what if this happens and what if this happens? But this was, this was amazing, Michael. Well, well, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful. I mean, we like I can talk about music publishing for days, and I would say that I have a really excellent working relationship uh, about what publishing is and what it's not, and I learn stuff all the time. And there's a lot of really, really, really good books. Um, I was going to ask you, do you have any? Um... I, 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 I would say my. F- Favorite book, um, uh, well, okay. So This Business of Music is a classic textbook that a lot of music programs use. Um, You know, they use it, you know, it's not a textbook, but people use it as a textbook. This Business of Music, it's really, really good. Um, It's really solid information. The problem with books is very often they're not as updated or right on the cutting edge as they could be, especially when you start talking about digital rights for things like sampling or digital rights for things like oh, neighboring rights, which is uh, a very little tiny, tiny little portion of, um, of publishing that happens outside the United States. Um, things like ephemeral rights and you go, what in the world is an ephemeral right? Okay. So you've got, uh, let me use an example, basketball game, Knicks are on TV and they're playing music in Madison square garden. So you're watching the TV and you hear the song. Okay. They don't need a sync license for that. But if the game is rebroadcast, 
the broadcaster would have to go out and license that song while it's being played for the rebroadcast of the game. And you'd be like, oh, why is that? Well, because that song is synchronized with the pitcher of the basketball game. So you need to go get a sync license now, which is why um, a lot of games, it's always an interesting problem. Either they kill all of the audio from the um, the venue or the arena where, they're, where the thing's happening in a football stadium, um, or they have to go figure out how they're gonna get the ephemeral rights for a song. So there's all kinds of little nooks and crannies of the publishing business. But like you said, having a working relationship to what is music publishing and the master rights you create when you write and record a song, absolutely the lifeblood so essential to you being successful. Can you hear me? Okay, we got one more. Um, any okay. advice on increasing your conversion rate on socials? Okay. So here's another topic we could do in, in hours, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a swing, a swing of the bat at this one. Okay. So social media is a conversation. So it can never be a conversation like I'm going to announce my new album and you are all going to listen to me on the soapbox. It just doesn't work. You have got to be willing to create a conversation with your fans, and your listeners. And when I'm working with the people that I work with at Artist Expansion, my consulting company, I make a distinction between fans and listeners because there's lots of indifferent people who may hear your music. You know, you know, it might be on a playlist and you might be at a restaurant and somebody holds their phone up and they sh sh shazam your song and they like it and they immediately put it on a playlist and they have no idea who you are. They have no idea where it came from. They just like the song. So that's a listener. A fan is somebody who has taken the next couple of steps, where the song came from, who you are, and to try to figure out kind of like, okay, well, you created this really cool song. Who are you? Like, is, is this a bigger conversation? Do you have more songs that I like? And so you really want to be creating narratives where you are taking, I don't want to say indifferent, but let's say passing listeners and converting them into fans because they like your message. They like who you are as a brand. They like your music. They like the fact that you fit into whatever they're doing in their lives. Because you remember how people use music now. It's a use. They don't, they don't talk about jazz. They don't talk about hip hop. They don't talk about rock. They don't talk about pop. They talk about the visceral experience of music. So am I driving to it? Am I dancing to it? Am I making love to somebody to it? Am I hanging out, reading the newspaper on a Sunday afternoon to it? Like, what am I doing to it? So the music has got something functional in it. And then if that song can kind of get over the hump of being just sort of a song that somebody's listened to a couple of times and it becomes a real favorite, then your song has an opportunity to become part of someone's really intimate sort of soundtrack. And that is... I know people who have listened to my instrumental music and they've fallen asleep to it, you know, every day for 15 years. That is a huge endorsement of your music because people feel that your music is a real catalyst to something. So if you can start creating that conversation, your conversion rate will go up, period, end of story. If there's a real conversation going up, going on between you and your fans and your listeners, your conversion rate will go up. What happens is most artists are afraid to sort of test whether their ability to convert with their own audience even exists. So they don't really ask their fans to do anything. And so they don't really know what their conversion rate is because, you know, they're sort of like, well, you know, I'm just doing what I do and I post what I post. That is a disaster. You want to be making offers and you want to see, you want to be looking at the data, how many people converted, how many people shared about it, how many people commented on it, what did they comment? And you will start seeing how effective you're being at not only creating a narrative for yourself, but creating music that is going to be compelling for your audience. So before I get a million things about this, 
you are not creating music for your audience to service them. Hopefully you're still an artist, you've got a voice, you've got something to say, sounds great. But at the end of the day, your job is to be a brand, because remember we talked about this, what, how people perceive your music and you and you know what you represent to them, and you've got this music and they, they've got to live in a place where people can embrace it and they go, yes, I am so happy that I've made this choice. And you guys know from your own careers and your own lives that there are artists that you love and you'd say, well, why do you love them? And that's such a complicated answer. Like I can tell you every single song I danced with my wife to when we got married. So I have all, I have an association with all that music, which is so important and so personal to me. So when I hear that song, it always reminds me of something. So having those memories and those associations to have things that people like to do to your music makes such a difference. But your ability to create a compelling narrative and to create a real conversation on social media is really the ticket to building your conversion. But on a regular basis, ask people to do things. Hey, add me to a playlist, make some user-generated content for me on YouTube. Do something that's gonna make a difference, not just for you, because it can't just be you, you, you all the time, but do they want to use your music for a kitty cat video on YouTube? Yes. You do. <laughs> I have dumb kitty cat videos that have, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 million plays on YouTube. Yes, you do. So the bottom line is you want to empower your fans and your listeners to use your music. You want to create a compelling conversation and you want to be building over time that conversion rate, because if you can really be controlling that narrative, the, the success is there. Yeah, it's like uh, creating an experience. Which yeah. Is- Hundred percent. You're creating. Your job is to create an experience which is unique to you and your brand. And I know that sounds like a circular conversation. I'm not trying to be, but part of what's going to make you an effective brand are the associations people have with the experience of listening to your music. So, for example, in my music, people use it for relaxation, for meditation, for yoga, their daily practice. You know, to calm down. They do all that stuff. And the bottom line is. They look at me as a resource for that. So if you can become that for people, like, you know, so like maybe you do like crazy, super edgy hip hop music. Okay, so that's part of my Friday night playlist. Sounds great. You know, or you do something that's like really dancey. Sounds great. Yeah, you're part of my Saturday night playlist, whatever that is. So the bottom line is, if you are willing to engage in a conversation and you sort of start seeing what people are responding to, you will learn so much about why people listen to you. Because I think most artists don't even know. They don't even know why people listen to them, why they're popular with certain people and not with others. Why do people like like one song over another? Like I did an album in 2019, no promotion for this song. It just sort of was sitting out there as a piano piece. I remember I improvised it in the studio. I, I didn't even write it. I was just like, ah, roll the tape. Oh, we'll do it. That song is now the number five most streamed song in my career. Like I have a song that has almost 39 million plays. I have, so this song had no promotion behind it at all. No, nothing. And it's kind of gone off and had a life of its own. So you'll see that happen over and over with your catalog where you're going to have certain songs that just take off. Certain songs that get put on curated playlists, you're going to be like, I don't know how that happened. Well, because this music has a life of its own, people start talking about it and it starts fitting into their life in a meaningful way. The comments are crazy. Everybody's saying thank you. So many gems. Everybody, you know, um, Lay said so much to apply. Uh, yeah, even, even for myself, I just have so many ideas now on how the artists can engage with the, with their fans, you know, telling them to do stuff, but also telling them to, you know, tell me how this song makes you feel, you know, you know. hundred percent. Like, I mean, because if you put out a song and all of a sudden it becomes wildly popular, check in with people, ask people questions. Like if you've ever gone on a great date with whoever, you know, that date's going to sound sort of like, I'm going to, and then you can ask them 
not a question and you're going to listen to their answer. Like in a certain way, social media is can be like that. And you can learn so much about your fans, about what they like about your music and what they expect of you. Yeah. That's a big part of developing your brand. What do people expect of you? And because a lot of people operate in the dark with that and then they go off and they create something. People are going to be like, that's awfully weird. Like I didn't expect that. Uh, wow. And you're going to be like, oh, I'm an artist. I defy categorization. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Oh, okay. Good luck. Yeah. So it's a balance. It's a conversation. And at the end of the day, how willing are you to be listening as much as you are creating the content? So you're pushing waves out on the world and then you're hearing the waves and you're pushing waves out to the world and then you're hearing the waves. Yep. That's it. Uh, Lay. Um, just said, treat it like you're dating, um, ask questions and be willing to learn about your audience. That's it. You know, yeah. I, you know, I, that's uh, great. You yeah. Gave us, you gave us everything, everything. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll close with one story that you guys might, you guys might dig. So for, so for 12 years, I was a Macy's Thanksgiving day clown. I was in the parade for 12 years as a clown. And every year the clowns would go to the Big Apple Circus here in New York City and we would be trained by their troop of clowns and, and just the most wonderful people and the coolest people and the, the, the coolest job. And they're hanging from the trapeze and they're doing all kinds of stuff. And so they would teach us how to be clowns. And they taught us something that I think is a great metaphor or how to be an artist on social media and really your whole life, even public speaking. So during the parade, the New York City police, they cordon off all the intersections in such a way where it's almost like the, the, the barrier, the police barriers are almost set on a curve and people kind of sort of set up in a curve and you can kind of run into these big open areas and do like a little dance or do something funny or, you know, make a kid, you know, laugh or whatever. And then you keep running down the, the thing and whatever. Okay. So what the big Apple circus guys taught us is that when we run into one of these incredible intersections and, and I'm not even exaggerating, there's like 5,000 people standing there and they're up in buildings and you can see people all over the place. The key to the whole thing is connect with one person. So you're doing your gag and you're looking at one person and you're doing your thing and you're making them smile and all that stuff. And you don't have to be with the 5,000 people on that intersection. You just need to be with the one. And what's going to happen is 4,999 other people are going to look at what's happening and they're going to put themselves in that conversation between you and that one person. So consider that when you're doing social media, instead of, you know, making a blast to 10,000 or 100,000 or whoever many, you know, people that you have on Instagram, you're talking to one person like a friend or a family member, or, you know, whatever, whatever empowers you. But the bottom line is it's a conversation. You're not screaming at them. You're not breaking glass to get their attention. You're not doing that stuff. What you're doing is you're having a conversation where you're just as actively listening as you are communicating. And the more you can do that, the more you will build your social media and you know, and it's, it does take time. It does take patience. It does take discipline and focus to do it. But when you do, you will have a audience of people who are converting for you and no record company and no publisher can take it, take it with you. You can take it with you. It's yours. They can't take it away. They can't, they can't like take over your socials and, you know, you know, supplant you. Even if you sell your catalog, you still have control over the narrative of who and what you are as an artist. And that's, that's real power. Absolutely. Man, Michael, thank you so, so much. You're very um, welcome. I look forward to doing this again in person. Yeah. Um, Let's see some real people. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. Uh, and it, it'll, it'll be more impactful and, you know, all that good stuff. So, man, thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I, I, I just did. thank you so much to the whole team at uh, 24 seven. You guys have been so great. I love this. I love the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, just, a, just a quick plug for myself, artistexpansion.com is my consulting company. I work with artists. I do label services. I do social media. I do 
Uh, I even will look at contracts and then I'll send you off to a lawyer if you need one. The bottom line is, uh, you know, my job is to empower artists and to give them tools that they can be using for the next three to five years to build their own careers. All right. I'm going to send this out to, um, to everyone, uh, everyone that's in the community and anyone who is not in the community, you'll get an email with uh michael's information on the bottom awesome all right all right and if you haven't already i put it in the chat uh you can tap into the 24 7 artist community um and i'll also send out when it's sent in an email i'll give you all the links you need and the book was was it the business of music this business of music this, 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 this business of music. <laughs> I, I, re- I, I used to use that text uh, at City College of New York, and it's, uh, it's a great book. And, okay. and uh, I, I, the, the one I have now is older. And I, I'm, I'm sure they, they're updating it at like every six months because things are changing all the time. Yeah. But, um, but it, it's a really, it's a really good reference uh, book, and, and it's very accurate. All right. Perfect. So you guys will get all that information again. Thank you so much to everybody who joined and thank you, Michael. Guys, thanks so much for, for joining. I really appreciate it. Have a great night, everybody. You too.